you know, there's some headlines you just don't think that you're going to see ever, and then they happen. Catholic group spent $4 million tracking priests who use gay hookup apps. Just take a minute and let that one sink in. From the New York Post, a Colorado Catholic group spent millions tracking clerics who used mostly gay hookup apps, then outing them to bishops. The head of Catholic Laity and Clergy for Renewal, that's a mouthful, admitted its secretive research in a lengthy response Thursday to an expose by the Washington Post. Apparently they had used four mil- at least $4 million buying up data, mostly from Grindr, but also from other related apps, uh, and they were just trying to find dirt on um, clergy who were potentially using that. The Renewal's president, Jade, Jade Hendricks, confirmed the work in an op-ed on First Things, saying he felt blessed to help and promising that he'd be meticulous to ensure that we were doing things by the book. The purpose was simple, to love the church and to help the church to be holy, with every tool she could be given, Hendricks said, including the darker side of technology. Trafficking in obscene content and even criminal content is a risk to the church and her children, he wrote, of earlier heart-wrenching wake-up calls of grooming and abuse. Now, What is that context that he's talking about for grooming and abuse? In an op-ed he wrote, that's Jade Hendricks, he wrote this a few days ago on a website called First Things. In 2018, the scandal involving then-Cardinal Theodore McCarrick shocked the Catholic world. McCarrick had a global presence. He operated at the highest levels of the church and he enjoyed the highest esteem, both among Catholics and more broadly. But then it was revealed that he had been grooming and sexually abusing young men for decades. Now, when you think of a Catholic priest, what comes to mind? I know what comes to mind for a lot of people is abusing young men. It's a sad stereotype of Catholic priests, and I by no means say that all of them are like that, but clearly it does happen. So the Catholic Catholic Church's response was to spend $4 million on buying data to try and out people like this. Now, I can get doing this by the book, and if you're doing it by the law, I don't really have a problem with it. But that quote that he said of being meticulous to ensure that we're doing things by the book and feeling blessed to help, this feels like a damage control kind of thing where some kind of giant scandal happened and now you're trying to spend all this money to make sure that other things like that don't happen. But if you're the clergy and you're accepting members into the clergy to, you know, run the church, shouldn't you be doing those kinds of background checks to start with? Shouldn't you not need the damage control money? Wouldn't you be able to point out if someone was doing things that were criminal or even just against the Bible in some respect and not put them in the clergy? The Bible actually has some things to say about deacons and overseers of churches and what they should be like what their lives should be like and how they should be upstanding and righteous people. You know, it doesn't lay out every single thing they should do in their lives, but you know, uh, if you're married, have a a upstanding wife, treat your children well, be a good person, simple stuff like that. And if the Bible condemns homosexuality, then you can't be homosexual if you're gonna be part of the clergy. If you're part of a church and you're looking for the same salvation anybody else has, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a criminal, if you're some kind of thief or a murderer. Um, It doesn't matter if you're a regular person who gets angry sometimes or who's a drunkard on the weekends or if you're a homosexual. Everybody's allowed to have salvation. No one is excluded from that. But if you're going to then run a church and be part of the giving of the message that brings salvation to people, Shouldn't you agree with what that message is? Shouldn't you want to follow what the book says? From a practical standpoint, well, all of this terrible stuff already happened. So I kind of get their desire to root out the rest of it and spend all this money on trying to figure that out. I'd rather spend the money and figure out the problems than let that kind of stuff just sit there and fester. That being said, I just think it's a travesty that it has to be done in the first place. You know, there's a lot of people that want those stereotypes of the Catholic priest to be true, and this really isn't helping your case. What am I supposed to say? Stop touching kids? I mean, 
That should be obvious, right? I don't want to leave it on a low note. I've been researching a lot on the problem of evil, and I've made a video about it on the past, but I'm going to do some stuff on it in the future because it's the biggest question people have about the church and Christianity and Jesus. If there are evil things in the world, isn't that proof of a good God? How do we know what things are? How do we know that things are evil if there's no standard to judge them by? Like C.S. Lewis said, how could he have known what a crooked line was if there wasn't a straight line to compare it against? I certainly wish that evil wasn't so prevalent in the world. But every time that it happens, we have this conversation about good and evil. And every time someone brings up the fact that having all this evil in the first place is a proof for God because he is good. We compare all these things against him and we realize that they're evil. So in that sense, at least, all this evil is actually turning out for good because people then realize that God exists. I'll talk more about it later, but until then, I'll see you next time.